everyone and welcome. We are doing a Met Bull update with the Knowledge Bolide Hangout crew. The first time in 2024. Woohoo! Uh, I think it's our 190th in a row, something like that. We're, we're dialing in. I'm just going to hand the uh, controls over to Sue. Uh, take us through your Met Bull update, if you will, please. I'll do your slides. Before we get into the Met Bull update with Sue, I wanted to just briefly describe that the Meteoritical Bulletin Database is an online database that provides information about meteorites, including their classifications, uh, discovery location, physical and chemical characteristics, and it's a pretty uh, in-depth database that all researchers, collectors, and enthusiasts use uh, in meteorite hobby. So over to Sue. Thank you, Topher. <laughs> All right, guys, so it's been about five months since I've done a Metbull update. So um, tonight we're going to review the meteorites that were approved and published in the Metbull uh, between the months of August through the end of the year 2023. So there were 993 meteorites uh, in the data that I pulled, or 992. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. <laughs> and... Um, of those, uh, there were, I believe, 391 from Antarctica. So we had 191 that were found by ANSMIT, which is the um, American uh, expedition, and another 200 by CARE, which is uh, the expedition uh, from China. And on this map, I did my best to try to, uh, yeah, I had to look at a few different maps, but um, the small circle is, um, where the Americans were. Uh, that is the Dominion Range uh, strewn field or dense collection area. And um, the larger area over on the eastern part of Antarctica, uh, that's where the um, Chinese expedition was. Um, I was reading a little bit about just the, the landmass. Um, East Antarctica is um, like thick, thick um, shelves of ice. And, but they have like, if you can see those little blue lines, they have little melt patterns. And um, if you see where the uh, the bigger circle is, you can see a lot of the blue lines. That's where the meteorites, I think, are kind of like melting and depositing into those areas. So, um, and then obviously between West and um, East Antarctica, there are a lot of meteorites that are found there. And that's mm -hmm. kind of where the, um, like the ice shelves and the glaciers uh, kind of melt down. I'm sure geologists could explain it a little bit better, but wanted to give you a visual on that. So um, the meteorites that you see on the screen now, those were the ones uh, found in the Dominion Range. And uh, these were all found in uh, 2018 and published a few months ago in September. The Grove Mountains, this is where um, the Chinese expedition was. Um, they uh, had 200 meteorites published and they were found in a few different years. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see what classifications they had. Well, could you imagine going down there in 2016 and only finding one? <laughs> <laughs> well, they may have found more. Maybe they're just not approved and published yet. <laughs> Um, so, and as you can see, there, there wasn't anything too exciting as far as the classifications. But um, yeah, these were all came in October. So we're going to go over to Pat Brown, who's going to give us a brief um, ANSMET update. Thank you, Sue. Uh, wonderful map there. Yeah. So one thing that's unique about the ANSMET meteorites is each individual stone is classified as if it were just an individual. And so that's why we see some of these really large counts uh, and and why the the gross number of uh, Antarctic meteorites are larger than the non-Antarctics. The uh, ANSMET team is uh, still, most of the team is still in McMurdo Station. They were hoping to get flown out today, but there was a hitch. The, the whole ANSMET uh, program and a lot of the Antarctic uh, research programs have been very upset uh, with COVID. So there, the three previous uh, uh, expeditions for ANSMET were, were canceled because of COVID. And this year, they only have one group of eight people rather than two groups as they normally do. But they were hoping to get on a plane this morning, but uh, due to weather, they did not. So tomorrow should be the time they get out into the field. And uh, there is a Chinese contingent that goes, I don't think they go every single year, but I think they also follow the same scheme that each individual rock is classified. Uh, so it's uh, 
we're, we're almost there and they're going this year they're going back to an area that's really very close to the dominion range uh and the they won't be doing a reconnoitering uh mission this time just a uh a collection mission to uh systemically collect those meteorites thank you sue thanks pat appreciate it all right, so now we are going to move on to the confirmed falls. So these are the confirmed falls over the last five months. And uh, one that I was going to point out is um, Elmania. Um, that one was classified by Daniel Shake. Um, there's a lot of it. There's about 75 uh, kilograms of it. Uh, Matt uh, Stream, our friend and knowledgeable leg crew member, is a, a main mass holder. Um, he is hold, he holds about eight kilograms of that, and um, the main mass, uh, the largest piece, is uh, about one point eight kilograms. And um, a few of our other uh, crew members, our international crew member Sean Mahoney, is a main mass holder, and um, as well as Preston Allen and a few others. And there's also an Albright on there, Rantilla. Finally. <laughs> We're going to talk about Rantel a little bit later, but yes, there there were two Albrights, I believe, but yes, one um, witnessed Albright. So now we're going to move on to probable falls. So there's just two of them there. Um, and as we've talked about before, there are different ways that falls are classified now. It's not just fall or find. There's, you know, confirmed fall, probable fall. Um, so Manisa um, is actually um, the Canadian fall, and that fell um, up near where Smiley lives, up near Edmonton, uh, Canada. And um, the last section are the finds probable falls. And that's just usually when they don't have enough um, of the requirements to meet. So, you know, there's a possibility it was, it was probably witnessed, but they just didn't meet all the requirements. And as you can see on there, um, one of the um, classifications is actually Sanio, and it's from 1810. And that one I thought is really wild. So, I, like I said, I don't really like to read too much um, off of the notes, but the Met Bull uh, entry was really interesting. Um, you know, it says in 1810, uh, there were two small meteorite specimens that were recovered in the uh, Campanian um, area of Sanio. Uh, they said it was probably um, after a witness fall, but not recorded by official documents. The specimens uh, became part of a geological and mineralogical collection of Teodoro Monticelli, who was born in 1759 and uh, died in 1845. He was a famous uh, mineralo mineralogist from Naples, and um, he recorded this uh, fall in his catalog of exotic minerals. He was the register of his collection. The collection was then purchased in 1857 by the real um, Museo Mineralogico of Naples, Italy. In 2018, research carried out by Giovanni Aschioni, hopefully that's correct, um, uh, led to the rediscovery of two small chondrite specimens belonging to the Monticelli uh, in the cabinet. They were still preserved in their original glass jar with the original label, uh, which describes them as aerolite and gave them re inventory number, the place and um, where it was recovered, the year, everything. Like, can you imagine finding that, being the person that found that, you know, over 200 year old uh, meteorite? So I, I thought that was really interesting. I love that story. Did did you mention the weight of them? They were like tiny. Really small. I think it was only about 10 grams, I think. Yeah. yeah. So but I thought that was interesting that it, 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 the doc, it was documented in a collection, even though it was in the 18, in 1810 and the collection changed hands because it was documented and, and stored adequately, they were able to go back and be able to classify it as a possible fall hundreds of years later. Very cool. Yes, actually, I, I got so excited about that one. I realized I just jumped ahead. Um, I was only showing the um, finds probable falls. And when we look at the uh, Italy um, classifications later, that's when I was supposed to talk about Sadio. But I was so, wasn't I excited when I looked that up, Topher? Yeah. I, I, I was like, this is so cool. So we'll, we'll look at the picture of Sadio later. And then also we're going to have a little update on another Italian fall. So we're going to reclassifications. So um, there were two reclassifications and uh, one of them 
was a discredited meteorite. And I have to say that since I've been doing Metbull updates, I haven't really seen a lot of these. So I was a little bit surprised by that. Um, I read the Metbull update. It looks like it was just a human error that was caught right away. Um, obviously, within the same year, it was just a few months later. So it was a, a Ukrite. And now the new classification is terrestrial rock. Wah, wah, wah. No, <laughs> I no. feel bad now, for the person that had that class. Of I actually want a piece of it now. <laughs> I want a piece of it now. I'm going to have to track it down. <laughs> so we had another class reclassification, but I'm going to turn that over during our segment of Conversations with Hunters to Roberto Vargas. Hi, everyone. Uh, Hi, Roberto. Hey, Roberto. So um, I'm going to talk about Colang. So Colang fell at 4 p.m. on August 1st, 2020. If you guys remember, 2020 was the year of the pandemic. It was not an easy fall to be a part of uh, the recovery just because there was no way to get out to Indonesia. So it fell in northern Sumatra, a little place called uh, Satahi Nali. And it's the only CM12 witnessed fall. So there are, there are other CM12s, but none of them are witness falls except for Colang. Colang smashed through the roof of a gentleman by the name of Joshua Hutalang. And Joshua um, was a coffin maker. And like I said, it happened around 4 p.m. He heard the noise. He went outside. He collected it. And according to Joshua, it was still warm to the touch when he picked it up. Um I, as, as I said, I was part of the recovery in that. Uh, there were some times where it was myself, Jared Collins, Mark Lyon, and uh, like I said, Joshua Hudelang, um and Rob Wessel. So there were some times that we had to send money out there for Joshua um, to get that money so he could uh, sell it to us. And there's a 12 hour time difference. So there were times that I'd have to leave at two o'clock in the morning to deposit cash to then Western Union it out <laughs> to this this person in Indonesia that we had never met. So as you can tell, as as you can guess, um, you know, that that was stressful, but in the end it paid off. Um we got the stone. Uh I got my portion. Uh I sold a piece to the American Museum of Natural History who reached out to me and said that they wanted it for research. Uh, so it is it is still being researched. Um yeah, it was it was an awesome fall, awesome experience to be a part of. Uh I always love hunting and you know, COVID made it so that there was, you know, you had to get creative and uh think outside the box. Virtual hunting, you know, um was a thing. <laughs> was a thing for a couple of years there. So this is a, this is a beautiful sample, man. Yeah, see CM12. Yeah. Um is this pottery shard back here uh part of the hammer event? So, yeah. So so that pottery shard is actually a piece of the roof. I have a sample um that has the the piece of the hammer stone, the piece of the roof and Erlang Erlanga, I didn't mention him. He was also very instrumental in the recovery efforts. And he's a great artist. He painted uh, this scale cube. Uh, he made it look like a piece of the actual meteorite. And he also painted a really nice portrait of the fireball event over Satahi Nali. Thank you very much, Roberto. We definitely appreciate it, man. Very Thank welcome. you, Roberto. Thank you for having me. Hey, now we're going to discuss locations. And usually with locations, I just kind of rattle off where they um, have been found. But this time I'm going to try to show you a little bit more of the terrain so you can, you know, get an idea of what the land looks like um, where meteorites are being found. So in the last five months, we have had uh, 24 meteorites uh, classified uh, from the United States. And that's a lot for us. Um, one of them was El Saws in Texas. Obviously, that was a witness fall. And um, the rest of them were from what I think is probably a new um, dense collection area, uh, Stump Spring. And um, I did speak with Sonny. He's uh, Sonny Clary is the one uh, that has been finding these meteorites. And I believe he was also involved in Elsa's. 
And um, he's just been very busy and was out in the field, but wants to come uh, talk with the Knowledge Bowl like crew soon when he can. <laughs> um, if you go back to the last slide, Topher, you can see that um, it's crazy. It's so close to Las Vegas. But if you see uh, it, where the red uh, dot is, it's separated by a mountain range. And it's where it's found, you can see it's very flat. There aren't really a lot of mountains. And up a little bit northwest, a little bit... Um, very northwest. Um, that's where Death Valley is. So you can imagine how flat and dry this area is. And um, they've already found 23. And I think they're up to like Stump Spring 033 or 34. So obviously, there are more that are being classified. And uh, those, I think, were all found recently. I don't know if they were all found this year, but very recently. And now these are meteorites that are cold finds, so they're not witness ones. The people are just going out there hunting, but they're hunting in the right target-rich environment, and they have experienced eyes. Sonny Clary, you mentioned by name, uh, he's a friend of, uh, of a lot of friends of us on the Bolide, but he's not a friend of the Bolide yet. You got to get your butt on the show. Um, <laughs> we want you here. We want we want to hear about successful meteorite hunters. One of the things that that uh, um, my channel is plagued with is hunters asking for advice or wanting to find a meteorite, and and actually. These maps are very helpful. As we go through these maps, notice the terrain. Notice where these meteorites are found as Sue was bringing out. So I'm sorry. I didn't mean to steal your thunder. Here's your next slide. No, definitely. Uh, and Sonny definitely wants to come talk to the crew. And he seems like a really nice guy. I've never met him in person, but super down to earth uh, uh, virtually. <laughs> This was the one I mentioned earlier. So there was only one in Canada. This is uh, Manisa. This is the one I mentioned uh, landed near where Smiley lives up north. Uh, a boot, um, <laughs> our buddy, you betcha. Now going over to Italy, and this is the one I got a little too excited about. Uh, this is the Sanio uh, ball that was uh, from, you know, over 200 years ago. And um there's the information about it. Yep, Topher was right. Only 10 ah. grams. <laughs> I knew you were supposed to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, well, I, there was another reason I was really excited about it. And um, I'm going to touch on um, another Italian fall. And now this was part of, it, look at that picture. Isn't that amazing? That's a very ancient Italian um, town. It was the best picture I could find of it. But like, if you look that place up, it's, oh my gosh, all the pictures are really cool. Um so in my last MEPL update, I mentioned, um, a, I made reference to a paper about Renazzo and that it had been reclassified recently. And um, I don't know that we included the link um, in our video, um, but I remember putting it in the comments at wherever we posted it. And um, the person that actually did all the research actually noticed and saw the video. And that's one thing that I want to uh, sometimes get a little bit better at. Um, we never mean to steal people, other people's thunder. We do so much research and, you know, I try to give credit to all the pictures that we grab, but sometimes we miss it. We never do that intentionally, um, especially when someone does a lot of research and, you know, does such a great job and is able to actually get a 200 year old meteorite find reclassified the location, like actually pinpointed. Um, I want to recognize that hard work, um, but he had reached out to me and he was super nice and um, he actually created a very short minute and a half video for us talking about uh, Renazzo. And um, if you guys don't know, the 200 year anniversary is actually this month and they're gonna be having a very huge party in this area in Italy. And we'll go to uh, Thomas Mazzi to learn a little bit more about that. So this is really super cool to get a guest video from someone in Italy who saw our program and hey, you were talking about my work. Let me help you with something else. I love it. Good morning, I'm Thomas Matti, and today I'm here in front of the Church of Renato. 200 years ago, an uh, important meteorite fell here, exactly 500 meters far away from here. During the descent, the meteorite broke into three main pieces, plus many other small fragments. The main pieces were collected in, on area about 1.5 kilometers in diameter, while the smaller ones were spread over the surrounding fields. The impact point of the meteorite was not well recorded in the scientific documents of the time. 
After extensive research using all document and site inspections, I were able to reconstruct the event and find the main impact point of the Ranaf Fall. After the discovery, uh, Mr. Serra, Mr. Cacciari and I, we dug a trench to study the soil in Gallerani's field. And uh, we discovered interesting things about the layer of 1824, is more or less here. And uh, inside this layer, we found uh, a lot of uh, extraterrestrial material, like micrometeorites and so on. The research is described in this book that we wrote some months ago. In the next days, uh, there will be the celebration of uh, 200 years of meteorite anniversary, and uh, the original meteorite will be exposed here. And uh, the 13th and 14th of January, there will be the celebration with the conference and so on. Very nice uh, meeting. Wow. That's pretty <laughs> amazing. Unbelievable, the history. And he actually had a part in identifying from the old texts, old texts and research where it actually impacted and then found some of the material in the soil. Wow. I was so impressed with that. If you if you watched my last update, you can actually like some of the pictures he showed of the old text. I actually included in my update because I was I was so impressed. I couldn't believe that people had actually you know done that work and figured out like two hundred years later they're changing the coordinates of exactly where it fell. So I was really glad that he reached out to us and we had a chance to talk back and forth. So yeah, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Thomas. And he was a little bit worried about his accent and that we would have a hard time understanding it. But I understood every word he was saying, yeah. and I thought well, if we some of us try to you know speak in Italian, it would be uh, it would be disastrous. So yeah, great job and great video. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's Thomas or Tomus, but thank you Tomas. very, <laughs> thank you very much. We really appreciate it, and look forward to uh, yeah, helping us out with some more uh, great videos like this. Thank you very much. Grazie. Okay, so now we're gonna go down to Chile, 264 classifications. And I was very curious because they all said Antofagasta. So I pulled up every single one of these DCAs and I didn't pull up every single 264 of the meteorites, but I, I pulled up several from each one um, that had multiples and looked at the coordinates. And so I had I have the general area. So there are the ones up to the right top, um, Kalama, Limon, Verde, and... Um, uh, Conchiviejo, those are all um, listed as uh, being um, near the Kalama area. Um, the Chug Chug and the other two below it, um, the uh, Calate El Co uh, Cobre and uh, Calate, those are um, a little bit north of where the map is. Um, Sierra Gorda has its own area. And then um, obviously down lower, um, Paposo um, has its own area. And then the other three are all um, related to the area called, um, I think it's Taltal. Uh, -tal. And it, as you can see, there's a mountain range to the east, but a lot of this area looks really flat. And I believe Kalama is known as the gateway to the Atacama Desert. So, yep, those are the Chile um, classifications. So we had two um, finds in Russia and um, as you can see, it's this really small area and it's uh, between, you know, other, um, the Ukraine and uh, Kazakhstan, just that, that small area in red. And um, so we had two meteorites from Russia that time uh, during the last five months. And then wanted to show you this before we looked at the, um, the classifications in China. So um, a long time ago, there was, I think in the 1930s, there was a um, geographer um, who designated this line. And I think um, the layman's term for it is like the Hu line. And it shows the, like how disparate the population is in China. So on the left side, you can see it's very flat and there aren't really a lot of people. That is where 6% of um, China lives on like 40 something percent of the land. And then obviously the other 94% to live um, on east of the Hu line. So when we see a lot of the meteorites being found in China, they're not always left of the Hu line, but most of the time they are. 
So um, there, here's where the uh, Chinese meteorites were found. And um, if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll see that um, Ne Mongol, that's the Inner Mongolia, that is um, a um, just a, a province up there. You can see there's some um, green terrain up near the um, north uh, part of it, but a lot of it is desert. And then um, the next slide, Qinghai. It's a very, um, it's a large area. It's very sparsely populated. And um, this is, they have, this area is really close to like Tibet. So there's a lot of, um, you know, the Tibetan monasteries there, uh, things like of that nature. So um, it does have some, you know, green area and mountains. Um, now this one is uh, Gansu. Oh, you're switching Sorry. back and forth. <laughs> uh, Gansu um, is known for having, um, it's like the Silk Road. Um, there's huge portions of the um, the Great Wall of China. I think the Great Wall of China goes through the Inner Mongolia part too. And then if you go to the, net, the, the next slide, I wasn't able to find one that it, that it um, you know, shows the area with the red border, but this is where Xin, uh, Xinjiang, Xinjiang is. And this is where a lot of the meteorites are found. I think it was nine this last few months. And as you can see, there's a lot of flat desert there. And I I don't remember, I don't know if it's the Gobi Desert, but there's there's definitely a desert there. And um, yeah, so those were the um, classifications from China. If I could just pile on for one second. The reason yeah. why that line was important is on one side, there's people in habitation and they're constantly turning over the land, um, building houses, traffic, shopping centers. On the other side of that line, the Hu line, is undeveloped land or wider expanses of land that are going to be a more target rich environment rather than property that's been dug over for eons and generations of time already. Yeah, and I and I looked at my note. I wasn't looking at my notes when I was describing that area, and I I estimated it was about forty percent, but I was actually wrong. It's six percent of um of the Chinese population live in fifty seven percent of the land, um, so ninety four percent live on the forty three percent. That's pretty wild. <laughs> All right, so now we're going over to the Middle East. And so there was one found in Saudi Arabia, and you can go to the next slide, and that was in Najran, which is right there on the border of Yemen. And um, the next one was found in Iran, and um, that is the Sistan and uh, Baluchistan province. And I think that carries over to Pakistan too, because I know there's a Baluchistan in Pakistan, but just one found there. And then we had a few found in um, Oman, um, three in the al -Wusta, um, I think they call them gover governorates <laughs> there. Um, and then I think a few more that were found and one that we're probably really familiar with, um, Zufar, which is the um, Dofar uh, governorate in uh, Oman. So one more in the East, and that was, um, uh, Gujarat, Topher, any idea what uh, meteorite this was? Oh man, the most, the world's <laughs> most colorful meteorite. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, this is, I have it um, circled in, in red or um, the red border over to the left of where I have Gujarat. There you go, Topher showing you. Um, that area has uh, the longest coastline of any of the states. This is the ninth most populous state. Now, the ninth most populous state in India with a population of 61 million. <laughs> so, yeah, I think probably more than a few people witnessed Rantilla. <laughs> yeah. But these pictures were uh, provided to us by crew member Getty Brisgis, and uh, he took some really wonderful pictures. This is an exterior one showing the crust. Yeah, this is one showing the, oh, no, that's okay. Uh, beautiful. Um, we've talked about this uh, just on the last few Hangouts, how the Albright crust is a different color than normal crust, uh, yeah. that rich brown. It's so pretty. This is um, an interior um, picture of Rantilla. And then ooh, the next ones are going to be a treat. Uh, these are um, pictures that uh, Getty took under um, UV light. Um, this one is the interior of Rantilla under the UV. And the next one shows the crust under the UV light. Pretty neat stuff. Thank you, Getty. 
Yeah, thank you very much. And I think um, there's a video on, on our channel called The World's Most Colorful Meteorite. Giddy does an explanation uh, and hand demonstration of his 365 nanometer light on this. So it's definitely worth checking out. And the thumbnail looks like that. <laughs> All right, so Northwest Africa. 187. So these are all the ones that are NWA that don't have a country associated. Um, these other ones, these might have NWA, but they actually have a country associated with where they were found. As you can see, most of them were found in the beige area, which is the desert. We have a few, you know, random ones down, I think, in uh, Niger, Uganda, and Somalia. But um, as you can see in Uganda, over to the right in Somalia, they still have a lot of desert in those countries. I'm not exactly sure where the one was found in Nigeria. There's a good chance it was found in the northern part of the country. Um, but yeah, as you can see, um, you know, Morocco, Algeria, Mauritania, they, they always uh, show up big. Nothing from Egypt this time, but um, the rest of Northwest Africa delivered as usual. All right, so now we're gonna uh, briefly go over classifications. Let's look at achondrites first. And there's a lot of different um, categories under achondrites. So we're going to look at the primitive and ungrouped achondrites. And there weren't too many of them, but um, there was a, like a, a primitive ungrouped achondrite. And I think there's only 16 of those. Um, these are the evolved achondrites. And that's going to also include like the lunars and the Martians. But um, here are the ATD um, meteorites. And then obviously um, we have some angrite and um, albrite. For the ATDs, uh, we have um, a, one of those albrites was um, NWA15857. Uh, and that included three main mass holders. And two of those are international crew members, uh, Juan Avilas uh, Poblador and Sean Mahoney. That we also had a eukrite polymic that was uh, classified by Daniel Shake and uh, Sean Mahoney was the main mass holder on that one as well. And then moving on to the... Before we move on, oh, yeah. I want to drop a little bit of knowledge on people. A quick, easy way to remember stuff. You have H-E-D. The H's are on the exterior. The Eukrites are a little bit deeper down, and the Diogenites are the deepest. So when you're thinking about a Vestin meteor or Vestin asteroid that producing your H-E-Ds, the H-E-Ds are describing the depth as well, if you want to remember it that way. Okay, so next we're going to move on to the lunars and Martians. And um, the first lunar we're going to take a look at is NEA, and that's Northeast Africa. And that is, uh, is NEA 039. And it's one of 26 lunar basalts. Um, Mark Lyon, I believe, is the, one of the main mass holders. Um, he provided the photo here. And it was the fourth largest lunar basalt um, ever found. And for the rest of the lunar classifications, we're going to go to conversations with collectors and featuring our preferred classifier, Daniel Shake. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me again, Topher. And uh, pretty excited to be going over some of some pretty interesting lunar meteorite classifications that came out this year and going into the, well, last year, because now we're in 2024, but the year before also in 2022. So... So basically, there's a few interesting classifications that uh, Sue mentioned, and some of those also include this troctolytic anorthosite, but also this troctolytic Mount Breccia. And I thought it'd be kind of interesting to sort of shed some light on the difference between both, or just kind of the nomenclature systems of lunar meteorites and sort of how they got to where they are now, and kind of how they differ from like the Apollo nomenclature systems. So basically, when you see something like troctolytic and orthocyte, all that's really saying is that in that lunar meteorite, the primary rock type that you find, which is usually what we call clasts or just rocks in rocks, that rock type is a troctolytic and orthocyte. And what that means is that there is a classification system that was used for a lot of the highland rocks from the Apollo missions. This was from a paper from Stoffler in 1980. And basically there's this triangle where you have olivine, pyroxene, and plagioclase feldspar. And the relative abundances of each mineral, depending on where you're at in that triangle. So if you have a plagioclase rich rock, you have an anorthosite. If you go to an olivine rich rock, you have a dunite. If you go to a pyroxene rich rock, you get a peroxenite. Whatever combination or wherever you fit on that triangle, there's a certain designation for that rock type. So in this case, troctolic anorthosite means that you have 
mostly feldspar, but you also have a decent amount of olivine and very little pyroxene. So basically you plot on a spot and it says you have a troxylic and orthocyte. So that's what those clasts in that lunar meteorite probably represent. They probably have a lot of feldspar, some olivine, little pyroxene. So hence, because there's so many of those clasts that have the same rock type, the overall classification of the lunar meteorite is called lunar, troctolytic, and orthocyte. For something like a troctolytic melt breccia, that's a little different. So now what you're implying is you have... So basically the, the other thing, and this is how lunar meteorites are now cl being classified, is you have melt breccias, fragmental breccias, feldspathic breccias. I mean, you have, I think, vitric breccias too. You have all kinds. And that just represents that when you take all those classes of those rock types that you break apart because the moon has a lot of impacts and stuff hits it all the time, basically sometimes you're going to have a lot of melt and those classes fall in the melt and then it sort of solidifies. Those are melt breccias. You're also going to have stuff where the class just cement together and you form a rock. That's typically a fragmental breccia when there's very little melt. And if you have a ton of feldspar and very little of other minerals, we call it a feldspathic breccia. So what this means is that you, your rock type that dominates that meteorite are troctolites, hence the name troctolitic or, or troct as they give there. So olivine, plagioclase rich, and melt breccia just implies that in that matrix where those clasts, when they came together to form that meteorite, they were entrained in impact melt, probably from a large collision that mixed a whole bunch of stuff together. So hence okay. the classification is called a troctolitic melt breccia. A quick question for you, Daniel. Would we, could we, or should we assume that the melted material was troctolytic as well? It's definitely fair to assume. So it depends whether there's also terms used. Uh, there's one called aloftinus, and there's one, there's another one called autochthonous. And that mainly has to do with like how far away you are from like where the host material is. So what that means is that. If you take a troctolite, bring it to the surface of the moon, impact it, and it melts, that material is local to where the impact was, and it melted. So that would be representative of what forms the melt breccia. So yeah, you can have melted troctolite material that forms this meteorite. But you can also get material from far away that just gets ejected, lands somewhere else, and then another impact comes in, melts the local rock there, but that troctolite class just sitting in that melt. So you can do this by measuring the what we call the bulk composition of the melt. So you can just measure what the elements are in the melt, determine what sort of mineral phases might have melted to give it, and you can determine whether or not a troctolite melted or you melted an orthocyte or something else. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. These are Daniel's um, cl lunar classifications over the last five months. So, yeah. If you have any comments on any of these, we're we're here to listen. So uh, on this one, so there, I so this was just a. Primary, just a typical lunar feldspathic breccia. So most of the lunar meteorites we have are primarily this classification. So just dominated by a bunch of lithic clasts of mostly plagioclase feldspar and some other little things. But in terms of the overall lunar meteorite classifications, not as unique compared to some other ones that I've worked and on. Also not time. as large. <laughs> so what do you it's, think? A, it's a fairly okay. small sample, yeah. I'm not going to make a comment. I don't have a lunar classified under my name yet. Here's the here's the next one. So now this is lunar melt breccia. So you see how compared to the previous one, this one doesn't say troctolytic melt breccia. It just says melt breccia. That just means that it has a large, diverse suite of class lithologies or types. So it's not like strictly the class or troctolites or anorthocytes. They're all different things. But the the matrix that holds all these classes together is primarily melt. So it still gets the melt breccia, but it doesn't get that extra thing in gotcha. it because it's diverse. Yeah. That helps. Now, this one's a pretty interesting one, Ella Waynot. Uh, I actually, this was one of my favorite lunars from classifying this last year. And it's classified as a basaltic breccia. So, so now this is sort of an, a new thing. And the way this works is that the class type that makes up this meteorite primarily are basalts. So just fragmented pieces of basalts that came together in this sort of matrix, and then they solidify to form this lunar meteorite. I think I have a picture on the next slide. Yep, there it is. So the basaltic class are those sort of yellowish to orange sort of classes right there, and they sort of dominate the majority of the classes. So hence the term basaltic breccia. Topher, is that big enough for you? <laughs> 
oh no, I want to have it in my hand. It's not big enough until it's real size. Oh my God. Daniel, this are we actually looking at fusion crusted lunar right here? And, and, and if so, is it basaltic in nature? Is that why it's darker than I would expect? Well, to answer that first part of that question, uh, you know, I was I was wondering the same thing when I saw it. Uh, I didn't pay too much attention to it because I was sort of focused on those basalt clasps when I saw it. But yeah, that'd be interesting to know if somebody else has a good perspective on the crust. But on the clasps, they're definitely centimeter size, those basalt clasps. So, and they make up, I think there was, a, there was another photo I had of it where there were some other clasps as well, like some gabbros, but, I think but yeah, you can get there. centimeter size clasps. Wow. It's sexy, man. I'm I'm glad that uh, you're on here explaining to us exactly what the differences are because that uh, I think one of the one of the things you brought up with one of our guests recently, Dr. Alan Rubin, was the how do we how do we move away from the Apollo into more descriptive, not um, not um, the old nomenclature, lumpers and uh, and what's your thing? Lumpers and lumpers versus splitters. Yes, splitters. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But how do we split them into appropriately named groups that are descriptive and scientifically adequate? So, yeah. so there, there is. If there, if I can make one more comment. So there is Please. a new thing going around. Uh, there was a talk given at the Meteorological Society annual meeting last August, and the person who gave the talk was essentially saying that they're trying to now have like a combined classification system that could fit lunar samples recovered in the future from the Artemis missions with lunar meteorites. And one of the criteria that they tried to invoke was that whenever somebody classifies a lunar meteorite to try to at least be somewhat descriptive in some of the class lithologies, but also to upload photos of mm -hmm. the sample, either in thin section or of the, the rock, just so it's not lunar feldspathic breccia and like, nothing else given it's actual context into like what's in that breccia so just thought i'd put that out there but it's a thing that i'm trying to adhere to and hmm. describe the class types so. good because you're one of the most active classifiers there is on lunar so carry the torch sue back to you thank you sir Yes, Thanks, Daniel everyone. is very active. <laughs> I kept pulling up classifications and reading stories and it's like, oh, classified by Daniel Shake again. Um, and thank you for so much, Daniel, for explaining um, the difference between those classifications, um, like the, the troctolytic ones. Like you explain it in a way that just makes it so much easier to understand. I could sit there and read the Met Bull petrography updates <laughs> and just get lost. But you just, you make it easy. You take subjects that are really, you know, um, deep, but you make them easy to understand for people like us. <laughs> so thank you so much. So um, the, if, if anybody noticed, there was actually a new Martian uh, classification. So this is a one of one, and it's a Martian vesicular basalt. I believe it was classified by Carla G. And uh, we have some pictures here that I pulled from the Met Bowl. And um, like I said, I don't like to read exactly from the Met, Met Bowl, but um, this is a little bit above my head. So I am going to read a little bit so we can understand what makes this uh, Martian a little bit different, because it, it's actually a non on SNC classification, which you, as you guys know, there's not a lot of those. Um, this sample appears to be highly vesicular volcanic rock, um, appearance resembling terrestrial and lunar vesiculated basaltic lavas with um, abundant large vesicles and bugs, many two to five millimeters in size, some as large as one centimeter. Um, the exterior surface around the vesicles is brown and smooth with a red orange tint and some patches of unweathered black fusion crust are visible. Scattered green pyroxene grains are exposed on the surface of this meteorite. There's a lot more there, and I suggest go uh, take a look and, and read up on it. But yes, a new Martian classification. Wow. A, a super interesting, like you said, it's not the SNC, and it's not the or the orthoproxene one, this, and it's not black beauty. It's a brand new, like, holier than thou yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. it is surprising what we get excited about because as i was doing the data i told topher there's a new non-snc classification he's like whoa no way 
I'm like, wow, we're talking about meteorites on New Year's Eve. We're nerds. nerds. <laughs> All right, moving on to chondrites. And first, we're going to look at carbonaceous chondrites before we move on to the ordinary. Um, so here are some of the recent um, carbonaceous uh, chondrites. Um, as you can see, there's a CL3, which is uh, very rare. That's one of two. Um, we're going to look at um, a, another friend or another um, bolide uh, crew member, Yang Shencheng. Um, he recently had um, a CM2 classified, NWA 16301. Uh, we're going to watch a video, and then he also uh, provided some photographs. Um, and he did share with me that, um, you can play it, it's muted, um, that he this was kind of an impulsive purchase for him. It was a little bit ex more expensive than he likes to pay for meteorites, but um, he had to accept the offer because he does not have a CM classification yet. And he said another thing that is amazing about it is that it looks fresh, but um, there's not a lot of large CMs available on the market. So um, due to a lot of like weathering and breaking up in the atmosphere and such. So um, he said this one's really good for research. He actually donated a sample of it to his previous uh, colleagues where he, um, his previous institute, the Earth Science Department, um, Academia uh, Seneca in Taiwan, on, and um, they're very interested in studying the um, the pre-solar materials um, in the carbonaceous chondrites. So we also have some pictures um, that he uh, they're going to use. Um, they're analyzing it with the nano sims. So these are pictures of that same or CM. Pretty neat. Yeah. And Yang, Yang is is Correct. um is a very uh, much beloved friend of the Knowledge Bolite crew. And I will say we just got a package from him today with some provisional stuff that looks amazing. So thank yes. you, Yang. And we'll hear a little bit more from Yang later when we uh, get to the irons. So next are the ordinary chondrites. So as you can see here, um, we have the Enstatites, uh, the Ruma Rudis, and then um, the um, ordinary chondrite classifications. Um, the OC3s are pretty rare. The OC4 anomalous is a brand new, um, I believe it's one of one. And the OC4 melt brushes are pretty rare as well. Yeah, the, the numbers are biased by the Antarctics that were uh, classified. And again, each individual rock is classified rather than the whole thing. Th those may well be from the same impactor, uh, but separate rocks. Yeah, these these numbers don't include the Antarctic classifications. There's there are about 992 in total, and then close to 400 of those 992 were Antarctic. And then the we're looking the classifications we're looking at now are the non-Antarctic. But thank you for mentioning that because I forgot to mention that earlier. <laughs> so on the LLs. Um, the LL 3.10 is a one of 10. And then we also had a uh, Sean Mahoney um, had an LL4 classified. It was one single piece um, with remnant fusion crust making up about 70% of the surface. And then also uh, Preston Allen had an L3 uh, classified. And this um, L3 is really cool. If you go to the next screen, yeah, there you go. It's an LL3, I'm sorry. It is an LL3 with a very large H3 inclusion up to the right. I, I don't even need to point it out. I think everyone can see that. Um, that is a beautiful slice. So yes, thank you for sharing, Preston. Appreciate that. Yeah, very, very nice. Very nice. All right, so now we're going to go on to the irons and the stony irons. So we're going to go to irons first. And like I said, we have uh, another one from Yang. He had the um, an IID um, classified, which those are not very common. NWA 15939. Um, yeah, it's a 70.5 gram. And um, yeah, uh, one of 27. That was what I wanted to catch. So yeah. I want to thank uh, um, Dr. Yang uh, for your latest uh, little gift and donation. I just opened it before the hangout. I'm going to share it with everyone on the crew but uh, some very interesting things. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, he's, he is so generous. We, we always love getting packages from <laughs> Yang. So yeah, this is his iron, his um, IID. Um, he ended up, I think he cut it and etched it um, himself and uh, even put a layer of epoxy on there. But that looks beautiful. He does good work on the etching. 
Oh, that one that he sent today, the um the palisite that's uh that's in classification. Oh, that looked so pretty, but I turned it over. <laughs> Wait till you guys see that on our future show and tell. That's gorgeous. Huh. Yeah, super nice. And our last section, mesosiderites and palisites. These are the stony irons. So yeah, we're almost getting to the last. I think this is the last slide. So um, the palisites, um, the the PM, all the palisites together, we have about 170 now. Um, I believe the PMG group is somewhere around 70. And the ungrouped, I believe, are uh, there are 12 of them. I didn't get a picture from Mark, but he had um, a palisite ungrouped just recently classified. That's the one that you see there. I believe it's call, uh, called Mount Torniot. Um, and from what I hear, it's very beautiful. So we'll see pictures of that in the future. And so now we're at the end. If you have any questions for me, definitely let me know. I want to add to that, Sue. Thank you very much. You did a great job on this, on the, the information, the research, building the 90 slide, 92 slides. Woo. Uh, great job. Really appreciate it. Um, I appreciate you getting experts involved like Daniel Shake to, to talk about things that we don't know. Uh, I'm asking everyone who's watching this on YouTube, if you would, if you have any questions about anything that we discussed tonight, just drop them in the comments and we'll we'll try to start a discussion. If you have a rock. I don't care. I don't want to see it. Thanks a lot and have a great week. <laughs>